This is Poetry 2 Plus 1. Our guest today is Jose A. Morales, Jr. We're very fortunate to have Jose with us this afternoon. And without anything further, I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, so uh, the first one I'm going to read is actually uh, one of those scars on your knuckles. Um, and then I'll talk about it a little bit afterwards. Um, so when I was wet behind the ears, there were weekly wars waged on white terms. A mass of multiple men mashed my misguided mug into the mud. See, I was detrimentally determined to deter this dissection of my dream for hope. But when burning the rope at both ends, you can't be burdened by the beatings and positive you will remain peaceful. The taste of blood shouldn't become familiar. So I summon my silence into strength. Please underestimate me. Do it. I did, and I'm done. I'm done tearing tears away from my face in shame and instead grab the rope in the center. See, I found that four fingers and a thumb wrap tighter, more effective than words in this situation and the same amount of digits. For these murder mouth mongrels, I left no longing for hope. There was no pity, no sympathy. Whether it was virtuous violence or not, God did it feel good. And to this day, when asked whether to worry about whitewashed words, I proclaim with fire in my hands, don't, I didn't, and I'm done. Yeah, and that's, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of a weird kind of thing, but uh, no, I, um, just a little bit about that poem, because it, it uh, it's not necessarily, I always kind of uh, preface it, is it's, it's not necessarily like the, because um, it does it talk about violence in a very specific way. Um, just a little bit of backstory, I grew up in a very rural part of uh, Pennsylvania, um, commonly referred to as pencil tucky. Um, so um, when it comes to that, uh, being Jose Morales Jr. in a very rural area is not um, the best place to be. Um, so that was kind of a recap of, of, of that youth and, and, and kind of coming to the realization because I was never somebody that um, ever wanted to you know, have to defend themselves. I always try to be very peaceful, but, um, you know, sometimes you're kind of pushed into those positions and, and it was kind of me grappling with understanding that sometimes it's not something you want to do, but to protect yourself, it's, it's a necessity and just kind of showing people what that actually is. Um, so it, it, it is definitely, um, Definitely one of the heavier ones. Uh, it's one I, I wrote a couple years ago, and uh, and yeah, uh, it's it's been one that's uh, I've I've read for quite a while. Um, this next one I'm going to read. Um, the title kind of has no bearing. It it just stems from being in the Midtown Scholar Bookstore um, at a very weird uh, time. But uh, the title is called "I Love Watching White People Interact in a Bookstore." It is why I wish this was Atlantis the day before. Um, and just a little bit about this before I get it started. Um, I actually used this when I was uh, helping hosting for the, the cartels readings. Um, a lot of people, and I'm sure you probably experience this from time to time, but um, people come and they bring a poem to read and th that's kind of it. They read it, it's done. They never read it again, never touch it, never go over it. Um, this is one I purposefully wrote during the reading and added on to for months and months and months and edited and twisted and contorted and, you know, changed one word and then changed this line. Um, just to kind of show people that it, it, it can be more than just um, more than just kind of a one and done thing, especially with our reading that happens every Thursday. So um, yeah, the, I'll, I'll go ahead and read this one. And again, it's, uh, I love watching white people interact in a bookstore. It is why I wish this was Atlantis the day before. Love is European power outlets in Kansas. Love is Puerto Ricans playing ice hockey on the Caribbean. Love is coming out of a pool completely dry with an AK-47 firing fragments of stars into black holes hoping to see what is inside. It is creating airtime while blindfolded in a Cadillac DeVille on a road 
overlooking the ocean. It is hyperventilating underwater and drowning is an eventuality. Your pulmonary alveoli open ready to accept the warm embrace uh, of salt soaked air only to be filled with water seconds later. The tension tightens the abdominal muscles into pursed lips with one last thought escaping through them. Meanwhile, death is the millworks being the cultural center of Midtown. <laughs> death is cover bands at Tom Sawyer's and the soundtrack of Bourbon Street that has been playing since, I, since before I realized cocaine smelled good. Listen, death is painful and impossible to prevent. Now I could wax on about the sweet relief of that last breath leaving a lifeless frame or the feral screams of an ecstatic mind in the last moments of that epic decline, but I don't have that much time. None of us do. Both love and death are incomprehensible concepts, but goddamn, if one isn't a guarantee, it has no refunds, no returns, and no exchanges. It, it is as real as preachers flinging fallacies like nickels into wishing wells filled with bankers brandishing buckets to catch them and sell them back to you as your salvation, driving off the lot in a four-door sedan, transporting our politicians, promising change, hope, or to make us great again. Mission accomplished. With all of this, I've forgotten all about love. And see, these weary hands quake under the weight of helium, so you can imagine how they feel flailing at the wisp and whispers of a lover's attention. See, affection, real affection, runs the risk of revealing your honest intentions, and you tremble at the utterance of love like rumors of plagues in the next town over. Now, trading pelts with a stranger from that town over is exciting but dangerous. It is cuddling with an ax. But if love is the highest aspiration of fulfillment, then how do we not deliver ourselves from the hand of the beast for fear of devourment? I don't know. I don't know what to do when you're done. You just kind of, ah. um, yeah. So um, that one, and then uh, to kind of read one that is not my own. Um, this one is uh, actually one that uh, I was, uh, I got a recommendation from uh, a friend. I've been trying to, uh, for my new book, I'm, I'm really kind of going heavy on some of the, the ideas of, of, of love and death and um, trauma and, and, and pain and, and what that does. So um, as a part of that exploration, um, kind of famous for his love poems, but, um, I, I actually found a poem uh, about death, uh, and it is uh, Nothing But Death by uh, Pablo Neruda. Um, there are cemeteries that are lonely, graves full of bones that do not make a sound, the heart moving through a tunnel, in it, darkness, darkness, darkness. Like a shipwreck, we die going into ourselves, as though we were drowning inside our hearts, as though we lived falling out of the skin into the soul. And there are corpses, feet made of cold and sticky clay. Death is inside the bones. Like a barking where there are no dogs coming out from bells somewhere, from graves somewhere. Growing in the damp air like tears of rain. Sometimes I see alone coffins under sail, embarking with the pale dead, with women that have dead hair, with bakers who are as white as angels, and pensive girls married to notary publics, caskets sailing up the vertical river of the dead, the river of dark purple, moving upstream with sails filled out by the sound of death, filled by the sound of death, which is silence. Death arrives among all that sound like a shoe with no foot in it, like a suit with no man in it, comes and knocks using a ring with no stone in it, with no finger in it, comes and shouts with no mouth, with no tongue, with no throat. Nevertheless, its steps can be heard and its clothing makes a hush sound like a tree. I'm not sure I understand only a little 
I can hardly see, but it seems to me that it's singing has uh, the color of damp violets, of violets that are at home in the earth because the face of death is green. The look death gives is green. With the penetrating dampness of a violet leaf and the somber color of embittered winter. But death also goes through the world dressed as a broom, lapping the floor, looking for dead bodies. Death is inside the broom. The broom is the tongue of death looking for corpses. It is the needle of death looking for thread. Death is inside the folding cots. It spends its life sleeping on slow mattresses in the black blankets and suddenly breathes out. It blows out a mournful sound that swells the sheets and the beds go sailing towards a port where death is waiting, dressed like an admiral. Thank you so much, Jose. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.